There's never been actually data like this before. We've never known what CEOs actually do. And, and now we have some really rich data that uh, we can dig into. Fortune 500 CEOs consistently make headlines for making more money in a single year than most of us could hope to earn in our entire lives. In 2020, the top 350 CEOs in the US made over $24 million on average. That means at my current salary, I'd have to work over, I don't know, 281 years to make what they made in one year. Tim Cook, the CEO of Apple, was awarded $853 million in total compensation for his work in 2021. Mr. Tim Apple wasn't even the biggest earner last year. Rivian CEO RJ Scaringe took home $2.3 billion in total compensation. Good morning, Joe. Lots of comparisons now between Elon Musk and Rivian founder RJ Scaringe, but while Musk owns more than 20% of Tesla, RJ owns only about 1.7% of Rivian. Now, RJ is now a billionaire. And the one and only Elon Musk was awarded more than $10 billion in Tesla options. Stop if you don't like it. Suppose so. Yeah, I mean, from the money that you sell all your stuff, you could buy new stuff. Perhaps these two are a little more deserving because they were the founders or very early personal investors in highly risky companies utilizing unproven technology. But most CEOs didn't take such personal risk and many are still enjoying nine figure salaries. That is not my fault. This isn't another video to complain about how unfair it is that the average Fortune 500 CEO is now earning more than 324 times the median employee at their company. We have all heard it before, and it doesn't look like it's going to change anytime soon, no matter how much the internet complains about it. Now would be a good time to remember the age-old anecdote. If you can't beat them, join them. So it's time to learn how money works to get yourself a step-by-step -step guide on landing a job as an egregiously overcompensated corporate fat CEO. This week's lesson was brought to you by Helix, and you will need a good night's sleep if you want to become a CEO. For a while, I had told myself the reason I didn't sleep well was simply because I was stressed and that it came with the territory of being an investment banker. Since I quit that job, I still haven't been able to get a good night's sleep. That is, until I got my Helix mattress. Everybody is different, and Helix knows that, so they made a sleep quiz that matches your unique body type and sleep preferences to the perfect mattress for you. As a side sleeper who prefers a mattress that's not too hard, not too soft, medium feel, the quiz suggested the Midnight Lux King mattress was the right one for me. It provides luxury memory foam for pressure point reliefs on my hips and shoulders, so I don't feel like I've injured myself when I wake up in the morning. I even got the Glaciotex cooling cover on my mattress, and it keeps me cool when I sleep. I've had my Helix sleep for a month now, and I am shocked with how much different my sleep experience has been with it. I recommended it to my parents, and they took the Helix sleep quiz and now have one too. The best part of all of this is that Helix delivers your mattress right to your door, with free shipping in the US. The mattress comes rolled up in a box and is super easy to set up yourself. If it makes you nervous to buy something you haven't tried, Helix has a 100 night sleep trial, so you get more than three months to make sure that you love it. If you don't, they'll pick it up for you and you'll get a full refund. Plus, Helix mattresses have a 10 year warranty, and they even offer financing options and flexible payment plans, so a great night's sleep is never far away. Helix Sleep makes mattresses and bedding that are customized to fit your needs and conveniently shipped right to your door. I love my Helix, and I think you would too. If you are looking for a new bed, check out Helix. You can click on the link below or go to helixsleep.com forward slash howmoneyworks and get up to $200 off your Helix mattress plus two free pillows. Of the 500 CEOs on the Fortune magazine's list, only 21 were the founders or co-founders of the companies they lead. So if you want the abbreviated step-by-step -step guide, then step one, start a multi-billion dollar company and don't get fired by the board or retire. Congratulations, you're now a Fortune 500 CEO. That was easy. By the time you have completed step one of this guide, you will probably already be a billionaire. So maybe the thought of a day job, however well compensated, might have lost its appeal. Anyway, 21 out of 500 is pretty bad odds. So let's go for the more involved but safer set of instructions. The remaining 479 chief executive officers got their jobs by working their way up through corporate roles, which starts with college. I know my video last week was all about thinking twice before committing to a college degree, but if you want the top job at one of these companies, a degree is mandatory. 
Every single non-founding CEO of a Fortune 500 company has a college degree. Out of the 21 founding CEOs, 16 of them have at least a bachelor's degree, and the remaining five, like Mark Zuckerberg, dropped out of schools like Harvard because their businesses started taking off before they could finish their degree. I know the story of a high school dropout starting a successful company is popular, but the numbers don't lie. If you want to get to this level, you need to go to college. Society has rules, and the first rule is you go to college. You want to have a happy and successful life? You go to college. If you want to be somebody, you go to college. If you want to fit in, you go to college. You also need to go to a good college. Almost 10% of the list of non-founding CEOs went to just one particular school. That's right, DeVry University. Yeah, no, obviously it was Harvard. The other Ivy League schools are very well represented in this group of CEOs as well. Once you get into one of these schools, you need to pick what to study. 41% of Fortune 500 CEOs have an MBA, which is a Master's of Business Administration, so that's a solid pick. MBA programs focus on business structures, corporate governance, and the roles of executives and organizations, so it makes sense that this is the top pick. A lot of companies will actually make their senior executives complete an MBA part-time while working their regular hours. It's a grueling task on top of the regular commitments of a corporate executive, but sometimes the companies actually pay for their executives to get these degrees because of how valuable they can be. In addition to the lessons you learn about the general mechanics of running a company, the connections you can make at an Ivy League are worth the tuition costs themselves. So many powerful and influential people coming from these schools creates a self-fulfilling prophecy of more people coming from these schools because they spent their time there interacting with powerful and influential people. So if you want to be a Fortune 500 CEO, your best chance will come from getting into an Ivy League MBA program and networking like crazy while you're there. But an MBA is a master's degree. Master's degrees are postgraduate degrees, which means you need to get an undergraduate or bachelor's degree first. Picking the right degree straight out of high school might feel like a bit of a crapshoot, but Fortune 500 CEOs overwhelmingly favor one type of degree above the others. You might think this would be a business, finance, or economics degree, but you would be wrong. 97 of the 500 CEOs on this list studied engineering as an undergraduate. There is some selection bias to this. Engineering is a tough degree to get into, and unlike law or medicine, it does not have a narrow path of progression. But engineers are still a highly prized asset in the business world. Fortune 500 CEO engineers who were interviewed about their careers admitted that they chose to study engineering because it had the lowest unemployment rates and great options for career advancement. People that are thinking like that at the age of 18 are people that will go on to lead Fortune 500 companies, and people like that pick engineering. We hire great engineers as fast as we can find them. Engineers are trained to be good with numbers and complicated sets of information, but they are also trained to use their skills to complete projects while collaborating with other people with differing expertise. Engineers are also quite valuable to startups as early technical employees. The list of Fortune 500 companies is dominated by businesses that were once startups not very long ago, and early employees with the right skills are prime candidates for the top job once the founder steps down. The school you complete your bachelor's degree at is much less important than the school you get your MBA from. The most represented undergraduate school amongst the Fortune 500 CEOs was still Harvard, but only three of them went for their bachelor's degree, with the rest of the list spread out amongst more than 300 other schools. So just go to the best school you can and work on being near the top of your class, which will make step two a lot easier. The average age of a Fortune 500 CEO is 57. So don't worry, once you have graduated from your engineering degree, you have plenty of time to work on your career to get yourself into a Harvard MBA. If you want to be the CEO of a big company, you have two options. Option one is to start working with promising startups. If you hitch your wagon to the next Google or Amazon, you will be a prime contender for the top job, and you would have likely picked up some stock options along the way. According to the New York Times, the average net worth of the first 2,200 Microsoft employees is over $10 million. So even if they never made CEO, they shouldn't ever need to work again. This strategy is very risky, because for every Microsoft, there are thousands of other businesses with 2,200 employees that don't grow at all, or even worse, end up going bankrupt. To increase your chances of making this strategy work, you should target a business with around 1,000 employees with good institutional backing from a private equity firm and operating in a field with a lot of room for growth. Tech, finance, healthcare, and direct-to-consumer are all good options. Once you land that first job, you gotta do the hard part. 
which is work like crazy, outlast the other employees, hope the company does well, and be in the right place at the right time when the founder steps back and needs a new CEO. If you want to take a more active approach at landing the top job, then you should start your career off in a more established company preferably one with a good amount of business pedigree. Bulge Rack and investment banks like Goldman and high-end management consulting firms like McKinsey should be your top pick. I'll explain why later, but the competition for graduate programs at these companies is fierce, so if you can't get in here, almost any big company will do. Your mission at this stage is to get to an executive level role as quickly as possible. Doing good work is critical to this, but it will only get you so far. You need to market yourself in every way that you can to become your own brand name in the industry. Social media, if used correctly, can be great for this. My good friend Richard over at The Plain Bagel works as an investment analyst, but he is well known outside of his firm because of his YouTube channel. Now, you don't have to take it that far, but putting yourself out there will mean that you can make it a lot easier for you to jump between jobs as you skip up the corporate ladder. Internal promotions are slow and difficult to get in most large companies. The average employee that switches employers every two years earns 50% more than the average employee that stays around for longer. If you do a good job of marketing yourself inside your industry, you are more likely to walk into a job interview where the recruiter already knows about you or something good you have done which is a huge advantage over the regular schmuck with less than 500 connections on their LinkedIn profile. You can also fast track this process. The reason working at a top investment bank or management consulting firm is a good place to start is because you can work two years at one of these institutions as an analyst and gain more experience than you would in a decade at a regular company. Recruiters know this, so the exit opportunities for bankers and consultants can be extremely good, and you can often score an executive level role before you are 30. The traditional route would be to go from an analyst to a team lead to a manager, and then finally on to an executive, which will take a lot more time unless you get lucky with your job switching. A word of advice based on my own experience and no further research at all is that if you do want to go the investment banking or consulting route, you should avoid an exit into tech companies, even if you are an engineer by education. You should be able to land a good job with these outfits, but it will be difficult to move up because the culture of these businesses tend to look down with their soy lattes and on tap kombucha on the old school business bros who totally don't even know how to hacky sack. A better plan is to get a job at a big company that is really boring. A boring company is going to have less young talent, which means you won't be competing against every other hotshot career-driven 30-year-old to get an executive position. Once you have worked yourself into a role where you are overseeing at least 200 other employees, it's time again to start thinking about that Harvard MBA. Personal branding is again going to play a big role in getting you into this highly coveted course. Harvard and other Ivy League schools like to brag about how many presidents, Supreme Court justices, and Fortune 500 CEOs went to their schools, and the best way for them to maintain those bragging rights is to only educate people who their admission office thinks is likely to go on to be a president, Supreme Court justice, or Fortune 500 CEO. If you can talk confidently and provide proof to an admissions officer about how you have reshaped your industry, you are a lot more likely to get in. You will also need to do the GMAT, which is a test to assess your business acumen. If you seriously want to be a Fortune 500 CEO, this is just one of many tests you would have taken in your career, so study hard and you should ace it. Once you have received your MBA from Harvard, life should be pretty good for you. The average salary of a Harvard MBA in their first year after graduation is $207,000, and that figure should be significantly higher if you go back into an industry where you already have executive experience. Your next goal is the C-suite, and to get there in a Fortune 500 company, you are going to need to double down on that personal branding. At this level, it is not unusual for individuals to hire the help of public relations consultants to arrange for them to give speeches and appear in media, so they are appealing to high-end recruiters, but also to company directors and shareholders who ultimately have the final say over who gets to be the chief executive. Top CEOs do earn a lot of money. And no, they don't work 320 times harder than the average worker. But they do have the potential to make or lose investors a lot more money than 320 regular employees ever could. Part of that is just branding. If an executive that the general public sees on the news every morning is announced as a new CEO of a company, it can boost the share price significantly. The other side of that is if somebody that nobody has ever heard of is announced, then it will raise a lot of questions about who is leading the company, even if that person is just as technically competent as a person with a PR team behind them. Even if you do absolutely everything right, you still probably have about a 1% chance at best of becoming the CEO of a Fortune 500 company. But that's okay. 
even if you stray away from this exact path, you are still going to be making a lot of money and working in a very exciting role, but it will come at a huge personal cost. You have to decide if long hours for years on end are worth it for the chance to have your salary ridiculed by every congressman proposing a new tax bill. Because, oh yeah, that's right, if you do end up becoming the CEO of a public company, your income will become public record. So if you wouldn't feel comfortable putting up your paycheck on Facebook, maybe the job isn't for you after all. We enjoy the right to keep our personal finances private, which makes you wonder how we work out how rich the billionaires these CEOs will be working for actually are. If you want to find out the frankly scary strategies that journalists use to work out how much someone is worth to make their billionaires list, go and watch my video on why net worth lists are complete nonsense. Thanks again to Helix for making it possible to keep on learning how money works.